your favorites. Um, if you have allergies, river birch probably is not one of your favorites because it's one of the worst trees for folks who have tree allergies. Um, and as a forester, you would think I wouldn't have tree allergies, but I do. I'm actually allergic to a lot of different trees. Um, I went in and got tested and I can remember the doctor just kind of laughing when the tests uh, came back and it was like, can you do what for a living? So um, there definitely are good trees, bad trees, and it all depends on um, how you're looking at it. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start with is native. I mean, we throw native around, we throw um, non-native, we throw invasive. There's a lot of terminology that we throw around as we're looking at trees and other plants. Um, I kind of went very simple here. It's something that occurred within the state before settlement by Europeans. There's a lot of different um, definitions, I guess I would say, or nuances to that that you could look at um, as native, depending on where you're approaching it from. Um, introduced or non-native, and there were some of those that were on the list, and one that Pam talked about was Osage Orange. So Osage is not thought to be native to Ohio, but naturalized to Ohio. Um, been planted heavily. Um, it's one of those that folks planted for hedgerows. I had a landowner when I worked with the Division of Forestry who wanted to plant a fence row of Osage Orange to keep the neighborhood kids out of his yard. Um, so it does have thorns, but it's not something I would recommend for that. And then last but not least, um, this non-native um, issue that we talk about, because sometimes I hear folks talking, um, and I'll use one plant in particular about spicebush, that spicebush is invasive. Um, spicebush is native, but it's a very aggressive plant. And so we've been trying to separate some of that because I've had landowners who've come up to me and said, well, I was told that, you know, spice bush is invasive. Well, it's not invasive in the terms of a non-native plant, um, but it can be aggressive and take over areas. And so we have to be careful with our terminology and understand how we're using it and um, what we're looking at when we talk about native versus non-native and invasive and aggressive. So just some things to kind of set the stage. Let's see here. So climate change. As I struggled with this presentation tonight, um, there's a lot that we're learning about climate change and I'm working with some folks to try to put some informational uh, fact sheets together on trees and the impacts and I'll show you a website that you can kind of explore. Um, but climate change is gonna change not only our tree species, but it's also gonna change our soils. Um, and so the soils will change, which will force some of the changes to the trees um, and vice versa. So I think, you know, there's, a, it's a big area of information that we still all have to kind of get our hands around and understand what the impl implications are of climate change. Um, in Ohio, you know, we're starting to see some things. I can tell you a few years ago, I was at a conference in Alaska and, you know, they were talking about the tundra and the lakes and the impact, you know, five, six, seven years ago in Alaska was very visible versus it's not as visible, though it's starting to become more visible, I think, in Ohio. Um, so some things to keep in mind. I'm not going to focus a lot on climate change, but I wanted to put it in front of you um, with these great atlases that the Forest Service has there's a tree atlas and a bird atlas, and they're part of the climate change program. Some of our faculty in the School of Environment and Natural Resources have participated in these. Um, some of them are the ones that are gonna work with me on some of our tree fact sheets that we wanna get done. Um, but I've given you the URL. There's some um, tutorial videos down here at the side that you can take a look at and you can kind of play with it. And what you do is you can pick a species and based on certain climate models, you can see how those species are going to move um, across the country and in our area, you know, move north in Ohio or maybe northeast. 
Um, and so some things that you can take a look at, they're constantly, as you can see, where they're on the third version um, or version four actually of the tree atlas. And so they try to, as they learn more, data gets put in and they get updated. So it's an opportunity that if you have the interest in exploring some of the changes um, that we could see with climate change, both on the tree side and the bird side, um, here's a, a resource for you to kind of check out. So when I sat down and I tried to figure out, you know, what trees do I put in here? It's tough because there are books that are, you know, four, five, six hundred pages long that talk about trees. And what do you pick? As I said, I tried to go for some of the ones that maybe we don't pay enough attention to. So I'm going to start with the oaks, um, primarily because of some of the things you see here. We tend to overlook them. There's this thought process that they are just so slow growing, um, but they're not. There's many of these trees that can put a couple feet of growth on a year, which is pretty amazing uh, for some trees. They play a really huge role in pollinator habitat. And if you see here, over 500 species of pollinators depend on oaks as part of their lifespan. Some of them, it's what gets them through the winter, um, some of them, it's the larval stage, and I tried to indicate on the trees that are in the talk um, what really relies on the tree that we're talking about. Um, right now, we're looking, when we talk about Ohio and forest types, we talk about that Ohio is dominated by an oak hickory forest type and a beech maple forest type. The one thing, though, is in the last few forest inventories for the state, the oaks are on the decline and the beech or the maples are on the rise. And we don't know what's going to happen with the beech with beech leaf disease. So this goes back to, you know, kind of a diversity. We need to look at a diversity of trees in our yards, um, in our parks, wherever we're looking at trees. Um, and last but not least for the oaks, when we talk about our wildlife and that's the squirrels in your yard and birds um, and everything else, um, they're a hard mast tree. So they provide fruit that these um, wildlife species need and we'll look at some of that um, on some of these trees. But so they play this huge role I think sometimes is overlooked. But I also understand that as we look at some of these oaks that the fruit can be huge and a pain in the butt in the yard. Um, and a lot of these, you know, if we would talk about just the fruit, we probably could have some really intense discussions on pro fruit or not fruit. So um, we'll look at some of these here. One of my favorites is bur oak. Um, they're huge trees, as you can see in this image here. Upwards of 80 feet, uh, probably can push that a little bit closer to the 90. Very broad, if they're left like this one is, to just grow in the open, um, they can just have this huge span of crown, easily put two feet of growth on a year. And I can verify that. I planted some bur oak seedlings in a riparian buffer 20 years ago, and I had 10, 12 foot tall trees within about five years. So they were definitely putting on a couple feet of growth a year. They were in the right soils, in the right sunshine, um, and granted it all clicked for them, but um, they can be very fast growing trees. They also tolerate a wide variety of soils. And when we're talking about landscapes, um, sometimes we're not talking about the best of soils, right? We're talking about maybe soils that were just kind of put back uh, from construction with nothing done with them and maybe they've been turned over um, so the topsoil is no longer there. Uh, so for bur oak, I have seen them growing along a stream where they stay wet at least a portion of the summer um, and I've seen them growing on some pretty droughty sites as well. So they have a nice range and can tolerate um, a bunch of different soils and sites. And they do have this unique leaf shape. Um, when you look at the leaf, you can kind of see the top of it has kind of a mitten shape to it. And then there's a sinus, a couple of sinuses here that come in very close and it kind of flares back out. Um, it's always been one of my favorites because of that unique leaf and the acorns. Um, but 
again, um, everybody is going to have their pros and cons. So not super gorgeous in the fall, kind of an orange to a russet, can have a large acorn. So here is the acorn with his hairy cap. This one is not fully mature. I have seen these that are golf ball size, so they can be huge acorns. That's not real typical, but that can happen. Um, and so you need to think about when this tree gets of a size that it starts dropping acorns. Um, it's probably not the tree you want adjacent to the house and you've got a metal roof, probably a little bit noisy in that uh, aspect. But like all the oaks, they don't fruit heavy every year. And some years you may not even notice any acorns, but you will have some years that are just a tremendous amount of acorn production if everything goes right. Um, you can see these twigs have kind of these wings on them. That is also for me, I love that in the winter time because they're not just a smooth straight twig. Um, that ridge of bark gives it a little more character. And when it comes to pollinators, um, it's a larval host for these two pollinators. Ed Edward's hair streak and Horace's dusky wing butterfly and the hair streak is up there um, on the screen. So it plays a crucial role in it's their larval host and is part of the process that those go through um, in order to make it through their life cycle. Chinkapin oak, um, it's also kind of one of those fascinating trees. It's got some differences to it. And a lot of folks look at chest or at chinkapin oak leaves and think that they're looking at American chestnut. They can sometimes really closely look like an American chestnut leaf and be that narrow, but sometimes they're more broad, um, but still have a little bit of that chestnut. But if you look, it doesn't have chestnut burrs on it. Um, it has a very small acorn, probably one of the smallest acorns that we deal with. Um, and it's kind of called a sweet oak because the thought is that the acorns are probably a little sweeter than some of the other oaks that are out there. It's typically a dry limestone um, place that you will find big, large, well-growing uh, chinkapin oaks. I know a lot of parks that save them and they are growing very well. Um, so it's in some respects, it has some just some unique characteristics. And here you can see some of those. It's one of those that can have a very red to that burnt orange um, color in the fall. And there you can kind of see some of that fall color. You can see why some of some folks, if you look at a couple of these leaves, they're kind of narrow and they've got the teeth that you might think of as chestnut, but these are all chinkapin oak. They're trees that are great for birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Um, so they're part of that life cycle that we look at. As I said, some folks call them sweet oak because the thought is the acorns are small enough um, that they haven't gathered as many tannins as some of the other oaks may in their acorns. Um, you will see birds pulling these acorns off the tree. I have seen blue jays. Um, and different woodpecker species just yanking. And when they're done with the tree, you can look at the tree and it's full of caps. They've hit it right when the acorns are ripe before they drop and they just pull them right out of the caps. And because they're so small, they can fly off with them. They don't have to wait for them to drop. Um, it is the larval host for the gray hair streak, which you can see here. So again, it plays kind of a critical role in the hair streaks um, life cycle as a larval host. And so those things we need to kind of incorporate and think about, um, I think most folks would not think about oaks um, and pollinators. A lot of folks don't think about necessarily a lot of trees and pollinators, but oaks and pollinators can be um, a pretty big deal. So swamp white oak is another one I thought I would highlight um, as its name states. It tends to like, I mean, its native habitat would be wet bottomland soils. Growing in water is not a problem for it, which actually makes it a great tree for some of our urban soils that don't have a lot of oxygen in them. 
Um, because swamp white oak can grow in flooded soils, it doesn't need a lot of oxygen to grow well. So it can be a pretty nice landscape tree um, and do well in those kind of urban soils. Um, it's, if you look at its Latin name, it's Quercus bicolor. Um, and that's because of the color of the leaves that I'll show you here in a minute. They can have that russet to scarlet um, color. I always tell the story is that when I built my house, um, I went and walked through my tree planting and flagged a couple of trees. And there was one that just had brilliant red foliage like you see here. And I flagged it, dug it out, planted it in the front yard, and it's never been red again. Don't know what happened, um, but it did have this red color, um, but it just didn't carry it when I moved it into the yard. The yard is definitely more of the kind of dull orange russet. It's not very showy like it was as a seedling. But as you look at the picture here on the right, here's the bicolor. So the top is this dark, shiny green, and the underside of the leaf is this white. So two color, bicolor, um, which is where that Latin comes from. It's very much like pin oak. We always talk about pin oak has a tendency to keep its lower limbs even when they're dead. Um, and that's what swamp white oak's characteristics are as well. It's kind of the pin oak of the white oak group um, in that it keeps those lower dead limbs. So you are going to have to do some pruning um, to get those dead limbs off. Um, but as I said, it tolerates a wide range of sites, soils, and because it can tolerate growing in flooded soils, it usually does fairly well in urban soils. Compaction is not a huge problem with it. I won't say that it can't be a problem, but it can really tolerate some sites that, that there's other trees I wouldn't even think about. And Northern Red Oak is another oak that I think it's probably, of all of these that we've talked about, maybe one that's more commonly planted. You can see here on the right, um, the bark up into that fall color, that golden brown uh, look to it. It's probably our most widespread across the state. Um, it doesn't tolerate um, a wide variety. So it's not going to tolerate wet feet and it's probably not going to tolerate a more droughty soil. So it's kind of that in between. It wants um, some well-drained soil. It needs moisture, but it doesn't want to sit in water and it also um, doesn't want to be super droughty. So it's kind of that in-between species, but it has a very deep root system of the oaks. So when we talk about acorn crops, I probably should have talked about this up front. When you look at the white oaks versus the red oak group, um, there's a vast difference when it comes to the acorns. For the white oaks, they produce acorns every year without stop. Some years more of a bumper crop than others, but every year they're going to produce acorns. For the red oak group, which includes northern red oak, pen oak, you know, and some of the other ones, you can think of, um, they're gonna produce their crop of acorns. It takes them two years to produce the acorn. So if a Northern Red Oak tree flowered and started forming acorns this past spring, um, it is not going, it will drop the acorn in the fall of 2022. Um, and then Right, I gotta make certain I do my time. Um, in the spring of 2023 is when those will start to sprout. Um, so two years, um, you will see sometimes small acorns sitting on the limbs that are just these tiny little acorns. That's through their first year. Um, and so they'll drop you know, a year from now in the fall, but in the spring is when they will start to sprout and grow. So you're talking a, a two year rotation um, when you're looking at the red oaks. Fairly fast when you're looking at seedlings. Oh, I would say a very wide span of colors that you can see on them. Attractors of butterflies and hummingbirds, as you can see here. Um, and it also is part of the larval uh, process for the gray hair streak. So it's another one that those um, species look for. And I found it fascinating that it attracts hummingbirds 
you don't always think about hummingbirds and oaks. And this is one of those that hummingbirds are attracted to. And then we have scarlet oak. It's one that also probably isn't talked about. It can be a huge tree. I mean, 120 feet in your yard. Yeah, I could see some folks being a little leery about that. The odds of it probably, unless you've got the perfect yard um, hitting that point are probably a little slim. I have not seen one get quite that large, but that is kind of a recorded up to height. It again is kind of like the pin oak and the swamp white oak that it can retain its dead branches. So there is some extra pruning there, um, but you can see it's found in poor soils. So think about that as part of your landscape. If your landscape soils aren't great, this tree may be the tree that you wanna think about. Um, definitely has the red fall color, as you can see here. Um, very large sinuses when we look at the leaves. For me, trying to identify scarlet oak, there's a couple of things here. For oaks, acorns are awesome to try to tell them apart. If you can work on identifying the acorns, you probably will be much better than folks that are using other characteristics um, trying to ID trees. Acorns are great. For me, scarlet oak, this mid vein and these main lobe veins have kind of a yellow, yellow red cast to them. Um, and most of the oaks don't have that. So these deep sinuses that kind of look like a C if you look here, but for me, it's that vein color that really gives it away. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I did not put Ohio Buckeye in here. Um, I will talk about yellow buckeye and we'll talk about Ohio, but um, yellow is probably when you're looking at a landscape tree, um, unless you're willing to deal with the fact that your Ohio Buckeye is going to start, if it hasn't already um, seen Gennardia on the leaves or turning brown, they're starting to get crinkly, they'll start to fall off. I actually have already had a landowner email me that her Ohio Buckeye leaves have already fallen off. Um, so some years it's worse than others, but for yellow buckeye, it's less susceptible to some of those disease issues. It's a larger tree than Ohio buckeye. Ohio buckeye traditionally is kind of an understory tree. While it's a first tree to leaf out in the bottom areas of Ohio's forests, it stays kind of in that understory. So I always tell folks, if you're gonna plant it in your yard, when you're talking Ohio, plant it someplace where it gets some shade. It doesn't, you don't want full shade, but you do want some shade to protect it from the heat. It's not a great full sun tree species. Yellow, on the other hand, can tolerate more full sun conditions um, and doesn't seem to struggle as much in those. As you can see, it's listed as tolerating shade, just like Ohio, um, but yellow can also grow out in the open that Ohio is not nearly um, as good at. The flowers in the spring are kind of a yellowish color. Um, you can see here, but you know, it five leaflets, just like we see on Ohio Buckeye, the big thing is right here, um, the yellow Buckeye has a smooth shell and has upwards from one to maybe five um, Buckeyes in these shells. I've seen some of these shells that are softball size. And so four, five, three, four, five, um, buckeyes in there is not uncommon. If you are a wood carver, um, buckeye, yellow buckeye, and even Ohio buckeye are good for carving. I have a few things that have been turned over the years um, made out of buckeye wood. And then when we talk buckeyes, of course, with Ohio buckeye, um, as I said, it struggles if you try to put it in full sun. We have at least one or two at the Gwynn Conservation Area that are planted out in the full sun. And I always, every year, I just feel so bad for them. They need, they need some protection um, because they just, they look kind of gnarly out in the yard, not something I'd want in my own front yard. Um, but if you look at the shell for the Ohio, it's very spiny versus that smooth that we saw for yellow. So Ohio Buckeye is going to have a more spiny shell. 
Then there is the small tree, large shrub, red buckeye um, that has the reddish flower that hummingbirds love. And you can see the fruit is not quite as round. You'll get more of an oblong, a smaller buckeye and a much lighter brown buckeye. Um, but both grow well. Um, I think my red buckeyes, most of them get at least part day shade. Um, so they seem to do okay. They don't, again, they're kind of, one I have that's in full sun definitely has not grown like the others that have some protection. So understand those things. Flowering dogwood would be another one that I see folks. You see them, they're beautiful in the spring. Everybody wants one. You go buy one and you plop it out in the middle of the front yard. And I always say to folks, so where did you see it growing? Well, along the edge of the woods as we were, they need some shade. They can tolerate it, but they're not going to be super happy. Um, so these trees, you need to think about that. What's their native habitat when you go to put them in your landscape? This is one we don't talk about very often. Um, cucumber tree is one that is a huge tree. It's not, it's a magnolia, um, but it doesn't have what I would call the showy magnolia flowers. And typically, like a lot of trees that may have nice looking flowers, they're so tall that you may not see the blooms. And so you need to kind of think about that. But cucumber tree is one of the largest magnolias um, across the country. It can have a spread of more than 60 feet. So when you put these trees out, you need to look at that number because while they may only be a couple of feet wide when you plant them, they have the potential um, to go out to that 60 foot mark. And you need to think about that when you put it in the landscape. The fruit um, definitely has kind of a cucumber shape to it. You can see here um, some of them, and then here's the bloom. It's not fully open yet, but it's not super showy. Um, has more of a pyramidal crown, as you could see in the previous photo. Um, a very deep and wide spreading root system. So think about that when you pick location to put this one out. Um, and fertile soils. This one is not going to tolerate um, some low grade soils. It's going to need some fertility. It's going to need at least some type of moisture to it. Uh, if it's a site that gets really dry at times, it's probably not where you want to put it. When you find it in the forest, you find it in those um, forested areas where it's got plenty of protection and then it has plenty of depth to the soil. So we're not talking shallow depths of soils, we're talking um, soils that have quite a good depth to them with uh, that fertile mass from leaves and everything else that's worked into it. Here you can kind of see a mature one. Leaves can be fairly long. Um, and there's the, another shot of the cucumber um, when you talk about fruit. Kentucky coffee tree. Now I debated on keeping this one in here um, because it is getting more use. I'm seeing it more in street trees. Um, we have three of them that were planted behind the Dean's office at the OSU Mansfield campus that we use when we do our tree ID classes on campus every year. Um, I have one in the yard. I gave one to my brother who every year says, it looks like it's dead. Eh, it doesn't have a lot of extraneous limbs. So it has some very thick twigs. Um, so when it loses all its leaves, it does look like just kind of a big stick. But it is native to Ohio, um, found typically in those bottomland areas where there's plenty of moisture um, and then coming up the slope with uh, mixing in with some other forest types. So it doesn't have, um, you know, everything on one tree. You're talking a, a dioecious species and the twigs don't have a terminal bud. So when we talk about tree ID and we talk about using buds is one of those keys. It does not have um, a terminal bud. It does have lateral buds, but even they're hard to see unless you know what you're looking for. And so here are the leaves. They are bipinnately compound. Um, this whole thing here from down at the bottom and all the way around this area, that's one leaf. 
they can be upwards of two, two and a half feet long. So I always, one of my rules of thumb when you're trying to identify something, um, if it has a leaf that is going to be three feet in length, it has to have a twig that is stout enough to hold that weight because that leaf is not going to be a lightweight leaf. Um, so something to think about when you're looking at them. You can see here is a young one um, in a parking area on campus. Has kind of that orange cinnamon color um, as an inner bark area. So that's pretty typical. And then on the right, you see the seed pods um, where you can get the beans that you can actually make coffee from. I've heard that it's a very bitter coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I can honestly say I've never tried it. Um, but four to seven inches in length. And here you can see that inner area of the pod. They were used and I know some folks still do um, make coffee from the beans. You gotta know what you're doing in order to make certain that you process them properly. Um, you can see here is one of the blooms. At this point, these blooms are just starting to open in some cases and in some cases they're starting to form those seed pods. Um, but caveat here, raw seeds and pump, pulp are poisonous. So don't go thinking it's a nice gooey center when you open those. Don't go licking your fingers and uh, munching down on what's inside there. Make certain you process everything carefully. And Kentucky coffee tree is a larval host for bicolored honey locust moth and bisected honey locust moth. So again, a connection with our pollinators that depends on the trees for the larval host stage of the pollinator. So black gum, I love black gum, but I also know that they can be incredibly difficult to try to grow. And if you are not on the right site, you're just gonna watch this twig sit there and not grow or look like it's not growing every year. Um, a medium-sized tree upwards of 60 feet, also known as black tupelo or sour gum. Um, it's definitely commonly referenced just as tupelo. So you need to keep that in mind. We'll look a little bit at the bark. It associates with both wet and dry soils. What I can tell you is that we planted a couple on the Gwyn Conservation Area and they just did not grow. I mean, they literally, it was one of those scenarios where they just sat there. Um, and when we did some pH testing, because we we're having some issues with some conifers and other things, we got pHs that were like 7.4, 7.6. Well, that's not a black gum soil. Um, they are growing on the Mansfield campus and we have some on the OSU Mansfield woodlands that are two feet in diameter, just huge, beautiful trees. Um, but pHs, when the students did some testing a few years ago on the Mansfield campus, run from 5.5 five to 6.5. And obviously our black gum are much happier there than they are down on the Gwyn soils at seven. It's an excellent wildlife tree. It's also an excellent fall color. I mean, that's just beautiful to have in your landscape. Here's a little mixture of what you could see in the leaf color. Um, the fruit is there on that lower left and there's the bud in the center, but you can kind of see this blocky bark, um, very chunky. Some folks will confuse it with persimmon. So you do have to kind of pay attention. They're, they're different barks, different leaves but you need to pay attention because just at a quick glance, um, I've seen folks confuse them. But again, um, I think to have a successful black gum, you're probably gonna want a pH that's below seven um, or at least darn close to below and below seven because they're just gonna struggle in those higher pH soils. But man, if you've got the site, um, they are probably one of the most beautiful fall color trees, along with some other ones, but I think about black gum a lot when we're looking at um, that, those kind of characteristics. We're going to talk a little bit about American sycamore. For me, sycamore, it's the bark that makes it so interesting. So for me, it's more of a winter interest when you can see that bark from a distance because nothing else looks like it. 
Um, my dendrology professor in college used to call them the 60 mile an hour tree. That we should be able to identify them going home up 71 at 60 miles an hour with nothing else but a glance at the bark. Um, and he's right, if you know what you're looking for, it's pretty obvious. It is a bottomland species. So again, it's a species that tolerates standing water, which means it tolerates soils that are low in oxygen. Um, and it does well then on compacted soils. Now, American sycamore has issues, you know, with anthracnose and some of those things. So we went to the London plane tree, which has been heavily planted in the US, which is a hybrid. Um, American sycamore has one of these little seed balls per stalk, whereas London plane will have two. But what I have started to see, and I have actually some seedlings um, in a planting that I did, you know, 20 years ago. I always talked about London plain, instead of having that white cast to some of the bark, London plain had more of a green cast. I have some trees that kind of look like they're a hybrid of the two. Um, I have the double pods, but the bark isn't quite as green. And then I have some that are green, very green, that I would call London plain by the bark. But seed wise, we only have one hybrid one of the seed pods so they apparently are starting to do a little bit of crossing i always say trees can be very promiscuous and you know if there's nothing to stop them they're probably going to hybridize and we'll just have to wait and see you know what ends up out in our native forest but both of them could be planted in the landscape um one of the key characteristics is that the bud for next year's growth sits actually up into the base of the petiole of the leaf and you can see the leaf scar around this guy that just that means that bud was up in the leaf that you won't see unless you pull the leaf off um, some folks don't like the bark see this pile of bark so what i will tell you is this is a picture off of ebay and folks are selling sycamore bark for craft projects figured out a way to deal with that nasty, messy bark in their front yard, I guess. They are susceptible to anthracnose in some years. Um, you can lose a couple sets of leaves before the tree finally leaves out. Um, so it can be a problem, just depends on where the tree is in your landscape and how tolerant you are of some of these issues. Um, if you love butcher block, you probably really love sycamore. Um, I have a friend who has uh, cabinets made out of sycamore, and I have to tell you, it's some of the prettiest wood um, out there. And quarter sawn sycamore is even more beautiful, but they're both a pain in the butt to work with. So tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera. One of the leaves that has this unusual flat top, most leaves, think about it, go to a point can be incredibly huge trees, 200 feet if they're grown in the right conditions. Um, there's a lot of names for tulip, tulip tree, yellow poplar, tulip poplar. There's a lot of common names for it, but it is not a poplar. It's actually a magnolia. And if you look at the flower, you get the whole magnolia thing. So um, you need to keep that in mind. It's not a poplar, so it's not in that grouping with cottonwood and some of the other ones. Um, it is a magnolia. And as we talk about, it has some odd looking seed pods in the fall. And as you go through the winter, you look up into the tree, you can see those seed pods hanging out. Um, on the right, you see kind of this, it almost has, in this Im image, a columnar shape to it. Um, when they're growing in the woods, they are some of the straightest, tallest trees you will find out in the woods. And they can do that in your yard, depending on, you know, how you, where you've planted them and what they're competing against when it comes to that growth. Um, very good for pollinators, good for birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds. And one of the things is the, our oaks, our black gum and our tulip 
are all also on lists that are great for carbon sequestration. Part of that is their growth habit. Um, while black gum can be smaller uh, and slower, it definitely still fits into the grouping um, in the way it uptakes carbon and stores carbon in the tree. So you can think about that as another benefit of having um, one of the yellow poplars in your yard. And again, it's a larval host for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. So plays another role when we talk to pollinators. Sweet gum, um, very similar to what we think about with black gum and tupelo. Bottomland tree can tolerate a little bit of moisture. I wouldn't say that it's something that's gonna grow in standing water, but it can tolerate a little bit of water. Has somewhat of a rapid growth rate. Great for birds. Birds love those nasty little barbed <laughs> fruit that it produces. Um, but for me, it's one of those that has some of the best fall color along with black gum. Um, when I did my riparian buffer planting, it, it, all the rows ended at the edge of the drive. Um, I planted quite a few sweet gum purely for the fact that in the fall, I knew they would produce a row of gorgeous fall color. Um, and that was kind of in my game plan when I put them where I put them. So something to think about. And variety of colors can just be from the really deep purples and the reds, um, they're just all across that spectrum. They're just beautiful. So that's quite a few trees. We'll talk about some other things here, but I, so buttonbush, I was trying to think of a couple of shrubs that probably don't get um, as much airplay, let's say, um, as some other shrubs. So buttonbush is one of those that I think has some beautiful blooms. You can see here, um, forms that hard little um, ball as its fruit, tolerates water so it can grow very well um, in wetlands and wet areas. Um, we have a vernal pool on the Mansfield campus that has an end of one of the hoofs of the um, horseshoe in it that we call the horseshoe vernal pool that is solid button bush. And they're some of the tallest button bush plants I have ever seen. Um, probably upwards of that 10, 12, maybe even 15 feet. Um, just beautiful in that one end of the vernal pool. So I have a couple at the edge of the yard. And like I said, when it's in bloom, um, I think it's just gorgeous. So something to think about that's probably not on a lot of folks' radar. And then there's the witch hazels. And so I've included some images here for witch hazel. Um, whether you're talking the native, there are a lot of varieties of witch hazel out there and when they bloom and how they bloom and the color of the bloom, you got a lot of options. In my case, my witch hazel um, bloom probably like mid to late October. They are one of the fall bloomers and um, I have yet to have fruit on them. So they're still you know, muscle in their way up to that point in time, but um, they do bloom really pretty at that time of year because nothing else is in bloom. So another one to think about, likes to be a little protected. Again, when you see them in the wild, you see them growing at the edge of whatever habitat you're in or along a trail, something like that, where they've got some protection, but they still have plenty of sunlight to do their thing. And then we're going to talk about service berry. So there are a couple of service berry that are native. Um, this is actually one of my downies that is planted again, kind of along my driveway and the garage area, um, produce mass amount of fruit every year. Now I'm not one that goes out and collects them and, and does something for me. I tend to leave them for the wildlife. And that's the thing you have to kind of think about. So I'm planting this beautiful tree that looks awesome in the spring with the flowers. Um, the fruit gets to be this really pretty red um, mid, well, probably mid-June, somewhere in that, depending on the species. Um, but 
you can also end up with this, which was in one of my um, service berry here this year, a couple of baby raccoons that spent a couple nights in my service berry, just stripping it bare. By the end of the second night, these two little guys, they had it stripped. You could watch them just kind of plucking and stuffing service berries in their mouths. Sometimes they were just reaching out and pulling them with their mouths. Or the other one in the front yard, you get to watch the birds um, like this cedar waxwing um, help themselves to the fruit. So there's some pros and cons. I'm not super happy with the baby raccoons because you know they don't stay there. The next night after they were done stripping the tree, they spent a good amount of time on my front porch. But I really enjoy the cedar wax wings in the spring, so it's a trade-off. Um, but if you're going to put service berry in, these are things you're going to have to think about. Um, a lot of these tree species, you know, there's birds that will use them, but there's also raccoons and other things that will use them. So you have to be willing to balance um, what you're willing to accept when you put any tree. It doesn't have to be a native tree. Um, but the native ones, especially the wildlife, you know, tend to, to go for, though it's not just because they're native. There's just usually plenty of fruit like this cedar waxwing was working on. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a quick, um, I tried to figure out, do I add more? Do I take some out and we talk about other things? Um, as I said, it's a balancing act for me. But I also want to give you a variety of resources here. So when we're talking native species, sometimes finding data and info um, on soils and those kind of things for them can be a little difficult. So I've given you this link um, to the Silvix books of North America. These are old Forest Service books. They are not in print anymore. They're online as PDFs. But what you can do is you can go to the species that you're looking for. I don't have everything in there. Um, think about it, you know, from the Forest Service's perspective, a lot of what they were looking at were timber trees. So some of the more um, aesthetic trees are not going to be in the book. And like I said, it's an old publication, but it's a great resource to talk about soils issues. Um, it's got some great information that isn't necessarily in um, some of our more current publications that we use. And for me, one of my go-to books is Lucy Brown's Woody Plants of Ohio. She's probably the definitive book for native plants in Ohio. It's been reprinted. Um, she and her sister did the work, you know, in the early 1900s. They walked the state to do um, kind of a, an inventory of what's out there. What I love about the book is she's got a picture of the state of Ohio with all the counties and they put a dot in the counties where they found the species that you're looking at. Um, there are some small dichotomous keys like in the hickories. Um, you can go down through and try to determine which hickory you're looking at. Um, a lot of great information and like I said for me it's probably the definitive when you're talking about Woody plants for Ohio, the native plants, um, because it's just, it's a phenomenal book. If you think about, you know, at the time that she and her sister were doing some of this work. So um, you can see this was reprinted in 89, but I think I actually have an old um, hardbound copy right here laying in front of me. And I wanted to see, it was $7.50 when it was bought and um, it looks like this version was 1961, $7.50 versus 39.95. Um, but it just, I, most of us, most of the folks I know that use it, they're on their second or third copy just because they use it so much. Um, so it's one I highly recommend if you're looking for native plants um, and a good, she does a lot of discussions about where they found them um, and different things about the plants. We did this publication in the early 2000s when we had emerald ash borer knocking out our ash trees and we were getting a lot of questions about, you know, what do I replace my ash with? 
there's about 35 native plants in this and it literally was um, replacing an ash tree with another tree that was of similar size um, that would fit into the same spot that you had to take the ash out. So it's not talking about crab apples to replace an ash, you know, it's talking about the maples and the oaks and some of those things um, in different places. So urban plantings, woodland plantings, streamside areas. Um, so you can access it through this e-store link or um, contact your county extension office and they can help you get your hands on a copy. Some newer books that um, I've pulled up some screenshots Thoughts for this Native Trees of the Midwest, um, Harmon Weeks and Sally Weeks and George Parker, all, I think now probably all may be retired from Purdue, but they have this Native Trees book and they also have a shrub book. Um, the shrub book is the one I probably use the most because there's not great shrub publications out there when we talk about our shrubs. Um, but again, great information. A lot of the stuff that I included here um, it, it's well done and it's worth the money to have it. Um, if you're like me and you like trees and you buy just about any tree book, but this is a really good one with a lot of great resources to it. I'm giving you the link to this one because this one is no longer in print either. Um, but this was a publication that the U.S. Forest Service did, as you can see, in January of 2003. Um, and they have it online as a PDF. And so if you're into the oaks, this is a must have publication because they did a really nice job of covering the oaks that we see across the country um, and some nice reference points. So it's another one, you know, I, I had stashed away cases of them when they gave them to us and I tried to dole them out slowly. I may have one or two copies left, um, but they don't, Print them anymore. That's the downside of some of these free forest service pubs. Great pubs, we can use them in classes and pass them out, but then they don't reprint them. Um, and so we're left with these PDFs to access them, but it's a great publication. And as to online, um, this tree wizard from Arbor Day is okay. Um, it's not a wide variety of species, but if you're just looking for some input into what you're thinking about planting, you go through this tree wizard and you answer some questions and it will give you some suggestions. Now, I've gone through it a couple times looking for different things. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't, um, but it's another piece of the puzzle if you're trying to figure out um, what you want to plant and how to approach it. So just something I thought I would throw out there for your knowledge. And with that, I didn't do too bad. Um, we'll take questions, um, probably more questions <laughs> than I want to yeah. think about, right? Thank you, Kathy. Yes, we have about 17 questions in the okay. Q&A box here. So, um, and they've been upvoted, so keep doing that guys if you want um and we'll get through we'll start with the first one from ellie i'm sorry I just cut off the last name ellie i find oak saplings in my yard and would like to save them but they all seem to get to about six inches tall and then break off at the base of the stem this happens if i leave them as is or transplant them into nice rich soil any ideas why this happens so it's it's always tough without seeing what that break looks like, whether we're talking, you know, a stem girdler or something like a chipmunk or something that's chewing on them um, that's creating some issues. There isn't anything that um, comes to mind that would be, you know, don't do this, you know, because that's what causes this. There's just a lot of factors that could play into that. And without seeing that break, it's kind of tough to diagnose it. Um, but what you can do if you think, you know, if you want to try to eliminate that it's a critter, um, you could dig it, move it to the new site, and then, you know, take some chicken wire or something and make a shelter and put it down over the top so that you're not looking at mice or chipmunks or something getting into the tree or rabbits even. Um, and then that might at least eliminate one aspect that could be causing that. 
and see what happens at that point. All right, um, next one is by, uh, asked by Molly O'Shaughnessy. What can I do about Japanese beetles on the top of my Ohio buckeye tree? Pick them off, you know, ho take the hose and blast them off, pick them off. Um, you know, it's just, by the time the beetles are there, the tree has probably done most of what it needs to do. So it's not a huge stressor on the tree, um, unless we're dealing with a, a year where we're super dry or super wet and the tree's under stress from something else. Um, because buckeye leaf out so early and lose their leaves early in the fall, usually by the time Japanese beetle get to them, they're heading down the hill <laughs> for fall anyhow. Uh, we got Molly again. My very young witch hazel has some small suckers at the bottom. Should they be removed or will it develop into a multi-stem trunk? Witch hazel is usually a multi-stem um, plant species. So that's not unusual. It's, you know, you'd have to work. Um, I It's like, um, red buckeye is another one that I've seen both single stem and multi-stem. You want to keep it single stem, you have to work at it. And so witch hazel tends to be um, more of a, you know, a mass tree, it, it shrub, it tends to move out and just keep growing. So that's not unusual for it. Carol, uh, is there a resource for finding nurseries in Ohio that would have some of the less popular natives? So, I, I mean, you can email me and I can send you some lists that I've made up. Um, it's tough. There used to be the Forest Service maintain kind of a native nursery list in the Northeast, which Ohio was a part of. They have not updated that list in years. And so, you know, after probably over the last decade, maybe I've got a handful that I look at when folks are looking, depends on what species you're looking for. And if you're looking for something that's a container tree versus a bare root seedling, there's more options on the bare root seedling side than there are on the container tree side. But um, email me at smith.81 at osu.edu and um, I'll send you what I've got. Thank you. Laura Kappel, do burr oak acorns sprout in fall or spring? One or two years on tree. So burr oak is a white oak. Um, so it's a one year acorn, flowers in the spring, drops in the fall. And the white oaks um, across the family um, sprout in fall. So you can find them on the ground with the root radical already popping out of the acorn and trying to seat itself in the fall. Um, it's part of the reason why um, they're more palatable to wildlife. All of like white oak and bur oak, um, they're more, swamp white oak would be another one because they spend less than a year on the tree. They have less tannins in them. The red oak acorns spend two years almost on the tree, have more tannins in them, which makes them store better. So if you're a squirrel, you wanna stash away the red oaks because they'll last longer. They have more tannin in them, so they're not very palatable. So you really are gonna wait until January and February when you got nothing else to eat, and then you're gonna dig those creatures out and eat them tannin or no tannin. So white oaks like the bur oak in the fall, they'll start right away. Um, so they won't wait on you. They'll start sprouting. Kathy Burkholder's question, can oaks be used as street trees and narrow tree lawns and what species would you recommend? So street trees, I usually, you know, allow whatever urban forestry resources your, your city has, um, to whether they look at their tree lawns as being large enough for oaks. I mean, oaks would like to have a healthy sized tree lawn. They're not going to be super happy in a narrow, confined area. Um, but I've seen oaks planted in those areas. And what I've had some urban foresters say to me, well, we plant them knowing that they're going to be a short-lived tree. I mean, they're going to outgrow their space in 
a short amount of time versus, you know, they're not going to be there 400 years like the tree could live. Um, so it's kind of a balance. I would, if you're in a community that has, um, you know, somebody who deals with street trees, I would talk to them and see whether it's something that they even recommend for your strips between the road and the sidewalk, because they'll know better than me just kind of guessing. But most of the oaks want a much broader um, area to grow in. Yeah, the big tree. Mm -hmm. All right, Deborah Kanapke, is the downy service berry as susceptible to fire blight as the larger native species? She can't remember the common name. So I have, I mean, I have one of each and um, my downies, I don't have any issues. I mean, you can see how green and lush they were with little raccoons climbing around in them. I mean, the first night that the raccoons were in them, I knew that something was in the tree but I didn't know what it was because I couldn't see them until they started coming out to the edge the next night and plucking all the surface berries off. Um, so it stays really healthy and green. Um, my larger one uh, has more issues, but it's also in more sunlight than the other ones. The other ones are kind of protected on one side. So I think that there's something there as well. So I wouldn't say that it's as susceptible um, I have not had issues even with the large one in the front yard. It's got more issues, I think, about its location gets too much heat and sun. Um, Robert Nelson, how important is it to prune dead limbs that don't want to fall on their own? <laughs> so I think, it, you know, where is the tree? You know, what's, what's in danger of when that limb finally decides. I have a pen oak in the south yard, uh, the yard to the south of the house. Um, I trim the dead limbs because I hate hitting my head on them when I mow. And so it's kind of like you're coming off because <laughs> I'm tired of my shirt getting caught in them or my hat being pulled off. Um, so it's not necessary, but most of the time in the landscape, we will trim them, trim them up just realize that sometimes, um, like my pen oak that I did just trim up this past winter, um, is starting to put out some epicormic branches. So it's starting to sprout back out where I just cut the old ones, the dead ones off. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that if you cut those off, that you're going to be limbless. It, depending on the species, they may put out new sprouts and new branches because now the, the dead ones are gone and you know, they're like, oh, I have room to grow. Boom, I'm gone. <laughs> so depends on the tree species. Um, and it really is, it's more of, um, I think, a personal preference. There's nothing that's going to impact the tree because if there are tree species like swamp white and pin, that that's their nature is to hold on to their dead limbs. It doesn't negatively impact them because that's just what they do. Bill Dahl, question, do you have favorites, uh, have a favorite spring flowering native tree? Mm. Mm. You know, service berry hit at a really nice time. So there are springs when I would think that my service berry is probably one of my favorites, but I have to say that once my red buckeye bloom, everything else kind of loses uh, attention because they're just they're so beautiful compared to what else is out there at that time that um, kind of takes over. Initially, service berry kind of hits it, but the red buckeye come in and kind of knock them off the pedestal. Yeah, <laughs> scarlet color, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen with the ash trees? Will <laughs> they come back? Will some ash be resistant to the boar? That is the question. <laughs> So, you know, I think that we, we don't know that. We don't have a good answer to that yet. We haven't gone through a cycle. Um, but what I can tell you is we just did a workshop in the Mansfield woodlot. And I mean, the ash seedlings are everywhere. I have one in the yard that's kind of at the edge of the yard that I left grow. It's probably now three and a half inches in diameter. 
at some point I am gonna have to cut it because where it is a tall tree isn't gonna work. It's too close to the power line, but um, I left it really because it was like, let's see how long does it take to be infested? And you know, we're at three and a half inches, which is plenty of diameter. And it's probably the greenest tree in that spot of the yard. Mm -hmm. So I just think we don't have a lot of answers yet. Um, I do think that we probably are gonna find uh, some resistant trees as they go through the cycle. Um, we're planting some of the hybrid ash on the Mansfield campus with the US Forest Service um, so that we can pay attention. They've taken genetic cuttings from trees that have shown resistance and are planting them out for us to follow. And so we'll keep, we'll keep watching, but tree research takes a long time. <laughs> That's right, yes, it does, not overnight. Reese Davis, will the new cultivars of American elm, such as the new Harmony grow without the threat of the elm disease, the elm disease? So they are listed as resistant. Now it doesn't mean that they can't get it, um, but they certainly certainly show resistance to it. And um, I have seen some, we actually have some other hybrids also from the Forest Service lab at Delaware um, at the Gwynn Conservation Area and on Farm Science Review grounds where we're looking at some of the crosses beyond New Harmony and Princeton and some of those to see if we can find some that have um, better growth habit and show the resistance, but again, it takes a long time for tree research. So we planted those maybe five years ago and we're, you know, we're just getting into the early stages of impacts. Just keep waiting. Mm -hmm. Keep watching. Yeah. Um, so this is high bush honeysuckle. Is high bush honeysuckle invasive? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure which honeysuckle. High bush cranberry, is that what? I'm not sure. We'll go on to the next one. Is the swamp white oak deep rooted because the trees have a tendency to uproot in wet soil? So does swamp white oak have a deep root? So it does have a fairly decent depth to its root system. I wouldn't say that it's, you know, one of the deepest, but um, it does, it does have a pretty nice depth to its root system. Now, you know, any tree, what I find a lot of times when you're talking wet soils is that, you know, you have this layer of um, soils that the roots can penetrate and then you hit some kind of hard pan that the roots tend to go out because they can't penetrate down. And in those kind of scenarios, tip over is definitely a problem, but it's because of the soil structure and not necessarily the tree's rooting habit. So you kind of need to know um, what you're planting into. Are you planting into something that's only got four or five inches of topsoil and then there's a clay, you know, hard pan that those roots won't penetrate? If that's the case, then they're going to grow in that four inches of soil um, and not have a great anchor. So we got to know what's below. Mm -hmm. Your soil analysis. <laughs> Um, Laura Kappel, I live on a slope that has bedrock exposed so the dirt can't be deep. Will oaks that have volunteered survive a normal lifespan? So yes, there are oaks that can um, tolerate those kind of sites. So in Southern Ohio, chestnut oak is one of those that does very well on the dry rocky ridges um, in Southern Ohio. So there are some that can tolerate those kind of sites. You just, you need to do your research understand your soils and then match the tree. But chestnut oak would be one of those that probably would tolerate um, something like that. I want to go to some of the questions that were sent to us. Um, since we're kind of talking about landscape, what trees should be avoided if planted near a building or house? Issues with roots. Mm -hmm more likely to be weak limbs, things like that. So I think it's Arbor Day that has um, a great graphic that talks about, you know, here's your house. Um, if you're gonna plant something here, it shouldn't be any taller than this. And I'm drawing a blanket what some of those sizes are. So there are some graphics out there that give you some guidance 
Um, because what I see most of the time is somebody plants, um, you know, a Norway spruce, let's say, right up against the house when it's a five foot tall tree, knowing that Norway spruce can get upwards of 100 feet in height and 30 feet in width, planting it up against the, tr the house is not a smart thing. You're going to have to take it out at some point. Um, and then, you know, you need to pay attention to where you don't want roots going. And we always talk about willows and septic systems and those kind of things. So again, it kind of goes to know what you have below because there are some species such as willow and maybe some other ones that will, you know, be an issue in those areas. Um, and then understand what the mature height and spread is of the tree and make certain that you are far enough away from a structure that once it gets there, it's not going to be a problem. It's kind of like um, when I recommend windbreaks to people, it's like you have two options. You can plant Norway spruce, let's say eight feet apart, and then 10, 15 years come in and remove every other tree so that those other trees have room to grow. Or you can initially plant them 20 feet apart and not have to do any thinning. Um, so those are the kind of things you, you really do need to think about um, before you put that tree in the ground or even purchase it. Um, think about how much work you're willing to do. Um, and I'm as guilty of it as other folks. I've healed in some trees. I actually have three trees, three oak trees over where I healed them in at the edge of the field. And they are now all intertwined because I never got them planted. So when you look at it, one limb has a red oak leaf and one limb has a burr oak leaf. So <laughs> even the experts make mistakes. Yeah. Um, but I'll get to it. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, this. it's I'll there. It. It's in the ground. It's growing. It's happy. I'll get to it. Yeah. yeah. 20 years yeah. later, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is 716 and we're supposed to wrap up at 715. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to... Thank you so much, Kathy. You're welcome. This was great. So much information. Like, oh. And I think we added some of the links into the chat box. We answered as many questions as we could, guys. Thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, Pam, you want to? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Appreciate it. Be sure to sign up for our next session with du Drew Todd talking about urban forestry, a very, very important <laughs> concept as opposed to woodland forestry. So uh, we'll see you in I've, another month. I think I've heard Drew before. Yep, yep. <laughs> I used That's to nice work job. with him. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy, wonderful job. We really Welcome. appreciate it. And yes, I have five red oaks that are about a foot and a half apart that I planted as seedlings and they're absolutely beautiful, but I just haven't gotten in there. And now I'm like, okay, what should I do? So. <clears throat> well, a basil prune. <laughs> I'm a tree hugger, right? I know. That's why mine are all still intertwined. Uh, every spring I go out and I look at them and it's like, okay, so who's coming out? Yep. They're, they're all still there. So you can also I tell it. how it slows down the growth. I mean, it's a very good observation that they just don't grow because of that competition. So, right. Right. All right. Megan, thank you. You did a great job tonight. Thank you everybody for attending and we'll see you next month. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.